for <laughs> thanks nicole right, hang on are we done right, nicole it's two 30 seconds <laughs> sorry guys <laughs> it says we're live on facebook Perfect. Awesome. There you guys go. And yeah, so like Marissa said, um, if you guys don't want to be um, on camera, um, you can definitely take your video off, uh, those that are watching, the participants, um, because it will be live on Facebook. So that's just a good thing to note. I'm not a host now, so can you push record, Nicole? Yep, I will press record and I will make you the host before I leave, okay? Or I can, yeah, I can probably just leave it. Like, yeah, the host that's good. Record. Okay, sounds good. Um, make host. Perfect. Okay, you guys are good. Awesome. Have an amazing uh, uh, talk. Okay. All right. Bye. All right. Thank Bye. you, everybody, for your uh, patience. Um, a bit of technical difficulties there, but uh, welcome to our first event in our new campaign um, based around rejecting Rob the Roberts Bank Terminal 2 proposed project. Um, we have Irwin, our board president for the Wild Bird Trust, and he's going to be conducting this discussion and asking lots of really interesting questions to Misty and Leah, and I'll just hand it over and he'll get started. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for sharing uh, your time with us and uh, really thrilled to, to be kicking off this campaign. Uh, for members of the Wild Bird Trust of BC, you'll note in our Wingspan magazine, uh, we have a uh, special feature on the campaign and uh, six pages for folks to read up on. Uh, we'll talk about that and um but we've got kicking off the campaign uh virtually and in in the digital space we've got two special guests tonight uh, misty mcduffie is a con conservation biologist with a focus on fisheries ecology in salmon ecosystems and for the past 15 years misty has undertaken various types of field laboratory technical and conservation assessments in specifically in salmon bearing watersheds up and down the coast and she's currently working with the Rain Coast Conservation Foundation as the director of Wild Salmon of the Wild Salmon Program. So welcome, Misty. Thanks for spending time with us. It's a pleasure to be here, Erwin. And Leah Chalifor is a PhD candidate in the Balm Lab at the University of Victoria. And I believe you're, are you in Victoria or you're on the other side of the Rockies tonight? I'm all over the place, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> So uh, um, yeah, currently in Calgary. You're here virtually. Uh, your research aims to shed light on nearshore habitat used by fishes of the Fraser River estuary and up and down the coast, with a particular emphasis on the recovery of Pacific salmon. So welcome, Leah. Thank you. Now you're uh, both uh, solid guests for this conversation because uh, you know as we try to uh, understand uh, the the scale and the impacts of Roberts Bank too, we also have to kind of understand the science behind it. And we'll get into it a little bit later, but clearly this in a way is like a battle of, of information about science. There's different sciences and one science is better than the other science and it gets a bit complicated. Um, and I guess that's by design because in some ways um, these, big, these big issues are fodder for public debate and science in some cases gets weaponized. And, and we're gonna to try to unpack that tonight a little bit, learn about some, um, about Leah's, in particular, Leah, you're, you're leading this work um, in a new report that we wanna kind of unpack, which will inform this issue of Robert's Bank because it's, it's wiser, I think, to consider um, if the federal government, if, uh, if the proponent or if uh, the Port of Vancouver, if there's independent research, it's really good to understand all of those pieces of analysis and research so that um, we can critically assess those research projects on their own merit and understand how they inform this debate about Roberts Bank, rather than simply saying, okay, that's the science I agree with, that's the science I don't agree with, or that scientist is correct. So it's great to be able to dive into this, give it some time. Um, and this is one of three events that we're doing. So I think it'll, we have enough time to kind of unpack these issues uh, and get into it. Now, um, the, the, the research we want to kick off uh, is uh, conservation in heavily urbanized biodiverse regions requires urgent management action and attention to governance. So that's, um, uh, I guess, a, a collectively written um, report, and uh, we're going to unpack that with Leah. But before we jump into that, why don't we uh, first look at a, uh, a video to help viewers who are, are new to this issue who may not understand um, what we're talking about around Roberts Bank or why the Fraser River is being mentioned, um, what biofilm is. And so 
uh, why don't we why don't we uh, first look at um, this promotional video? Now this is um, a campaign video, and it's uh, um, Missy. Do you want to um, give it a little uh, teaser intro? What we're what we're about to watch? Sure. It it tries to give a very high level two minute summary of what's at stake in the Fraser Estuary and why now is not the time to be um, increasing the habitat pressures on species at risk. We need to be going in the other direction. So it, it focuses, I think this one anyways, focuses on um, Chinook killer whales and other species at risk in the Fraser Estuary. Yeah, here we go. The Fraser River flows into the Pacific Ocean. An incredible ecosystem springs to life. The Fraser is one of the great rivers of the world. Its delta is home to hundreds of species of plants and animals. Over 100 are already at risk of extinction. As a nursery and feeding ground, the estuary connects a food web linking fish, birds, and marine mammals across thousands of kilometers of the North Pacific Ocean. Some of the world's largest salmon runs migrate through the estuary. These salmon are essential food for endangered southern resident killer whales. For birds, the estuary is of global importance, serving as a crucial stopover on migration routes stretching from South America to the high Arctic. This includes nearly all of the world's population of Western sandpiper. Port Metro Vancouver is proposing to double the size of its shipping terminal in the Fraser River estuary putting further stress on an estuary which has already lost over 70% of its natural habitat. The project would create an artificial island roughly the size of 150 football fields, right in the heart of the Fraser River estuary. In addition to direct habitat loss, the project would alter the natural function of the estuary, including its ability to provide food for fish and wildlife. There are substantial efforts and investments being made to protect and restore the Fraser River estuary. Now is not the time to undermine efforts to restore Chinook salmon and other species. It's now up to the federal government to make a decision. Please encourage Minister Wilkinson to protect the Fraser estuary and reject Terminal 2. All right, and that is uh, just to get us started and um, good. So Leah, um, could you, if we can look at your research uh, and, and start with your, your research to understand a little bit more, let's unpack that first. So describe the research, um, what were the goals of the study? Um, and then we'll kind of tie it back into um, this discussion tonight around the mouth of the Fraser and, and, and the uh, Roberts Bank area. But, what was the study of the? Uh, what was the goals of the study, and uh, and what initiated your your interest in that in that work? Yeah. So the goals of this research were to um, assess this highly biodiverse region, the Fraser River estuary, um, which we know has numerous threats, multiple cumulative impacts acting all on it at once, um, and try to determine what the most optimal conservation strategies would be um, to take to benefit these species at risk. And so this was inspired by um, my two co-supervisors, Dr. Tara Martin, who's a professor at the University of British Columbia, um, and Dr. Julia Baum, who's a professor at the University of Victoria. So both of them have a long track record of um, ecological research and applied conservation conservation research, but a lot of it had occurred um, in other countries. And both of them were actually, you know, rooted here and wanted to look at this biodiversity crisis in our own backyard. Um, and so they recruited Laura Kyo, who was the lead author on this research. And she's a, she was a postdoctoral researcher who has a history of conservation work as well, um, and reached out to Misty and to Raincoast and local organizations to figure out 
you know, who are the key players we need to be working with? Um, how do we tackle this complex system? So I was brought on as a graduate student um, and this project was my kind of initial introduction to Tara and her work um, and inspired me to continue on to a PhD. So yeah, I think um, it's an important piece of work. <laughs> and um, the, the role of um, uh, Misty, how did you, what were the community collaborators on the report on, on the research and how is this um, science based from an, from an, from the academic, ac, acad, ac, is this like academic research or is, did this have like community components and community partners? Um, the, the priority threat management was academic research, but it brought together um, such a diverse collection of knowledge holders from um, First Nations uh, through to scientists to on the ground biologists, people who um, have particular expertise in the species that were being examined. And, and that's what makes this such a novel process. And when I was, when I first went in, in, in the very early stages, when Tara, I think, you just moved here from Australia, which is where she did a lot of this priority threat management and learning about how you tackle multiple species that are under cumulative and individual pressures. And this, this process of, of expert elicitation where you get the experts together and which in itself can be a feat. So hats off to the team that did it. And, uh, and, and really um, dive in on what it's, what's threatening, what it's gonna take to recover, and then what it's gonna cost. No, I don't, I don't, I don't always think of, like when I think about urban areas, urban areas is in the title, but I don't think about the mouth of the Fraser as an urban area. But, but I also just heard you say, Misty, this notion of cumulative impacts. And I sort of start to understand that there's urban areas all over the place, there's industrial areas all over the place, um, we like to think that the coast is this beautiful, pristine wildlife zone, but we know that it's not, given that, especially the Fraser, there's so much dense development. Is that what we're talking about? Like this kind of mixed mixed use of land? Is that why we're calling it, it urban? Is, so, urban you know, ha habitat loss in the, in the lower Fraser is huge. And it, if you were to look at an aerial photograph from more than a hundred years ago, you would see the extent of nearshore habitat and these wetlands and areas that salmon could access for rearing all this huge, huge floodplain. And um, just the diking of the Fraser has you know, cre has, has lost, you know, more than 70% of that historic floodplain. And then you add on to that all these other cumulative pressures. So habitat loss can come from that, like that physical alienation, and then water quality issues, water quantity issues, contaminant issues, noise issues. Um, so, so it, 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 you know, depending on the species that um, cumulative threats can be really extensive. And so, uh, Leah, what, what what are the kind of main takeaways from your perspective of, of the report, especially as it informs, we're not going to jump into Robbers Bank yet necessarily yet, but we're looking in that direction. Well, I think that um, a key and important takeaway is that it's not actually too late to save these 102 species at risk that we looked at, um, which ranged from plants to orcas, right? So. This is, the system is heavily impacted. It uh, supports the majority of BC's population. Um, it supports, you know, a huge amount of BC's total agricultural revenues on a tiny fraction of the land base. Um, it has Canada's most active port right smack in the middle of it, which is part of what we're talking about tonight. Um, but despite all of this, it's, it's not too late. And so I think a really important thing that the study found is that um, you know, we've sort of allowed this piecemeal ongoing chipping away of this habitat and this estuary. Um, but if we pull together, if we create a more cohesive governance framework with a shared goal of restoring the system, and if we essentially throw every tool that we have at the book, um, you know, then there is a, there is hope for these species. So, Many of the projects that Tara has used this approach for um, in the past have been large wilderness areas with fairly low human footprints. Um, and so they see things like 
90% probability of species persistence at the end of 30 years, um, maybe 80%. It's important to note that in this system, um, we were looking at thresholds of 50% likely to be persisting and self-sustaining in 25 years. And 60% is the positive outcome. <laughs> so that is a reflection that this system is degraded, that we have pushed it farther than we should. But um, basically we found that if we, if we employ a number of restoration and protection techniques, um, then these species have a chance to be around. So yeah, ultimately we found that we should, we should apply all of our management strategies that we have available. Um, but there were a few that had particularly high benefits and those included aquatic habitat restoration and prevention of further degradation of habitat. And so all of those things together really speak to where we've pushed this system to. And now it's kind of the moment to reflect and say, what do we value in this estuary? And what are we willing to do to keep these things here? Now, um, before we talk more about, I understand a bit more about priority threat management, but but in terms of the, the trajectory of this, um, uh, what Misty talked about, how many players there were at the table, um, what type of uh, participation from the Crown, from the regulatory bodies were there? Were, were they also partners in, in the research or this was more um, scientists from, um, community-based science organizations or advocacy organizations, um, academic institutions, was, was the Crown involved in this, in terms of like where this is, where this report is gonna be uh, speaking to in terms of people who make decisions, people who make, who, who control purse, spring, purse strings, what type of a process is involved in that um, in terms of the, still about the research phase, was that, Misty, when you talked about, you know, potentially a large um, cost to this, these, these, this uh, protection, rehabilitation, restoration, um, what, what's the involvement in, in those particular players who, uh, who do control decision-making? Yeah, the, so um, the, the neat thing about this process was that um, d like um, when you say the crown, so I would think of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, Environment and Climate Change Canada, the province, um, yes, that um, so scientists working for those agencies were absolutely involved in this, as well as academic institutions, as well as community groups, and um, yeah, Leah, Le I'm probably missing out some, but um. <laughs> we invited everyone. We invited uh, <laughs> local First Nations organizations as well. Yeah, the the interesting element about. Um, PTM uh, is that it often, it doesn't have to, but it often employs um, something called uh, expert elicitation, which is another form of data collection um, that is not commonly used in ecology, but is commonly used in other areas of research. Um, and is particularly useful when you're trying to get at predictions. So we can gather, you know, all the data that's out there from past studies by DFO and by other researchers on, you know, these species, their habitat requirements, um, their status. But when it comes to trying to estimate how um, removing some invasive plant species from an area of marsh is likely to impact a population of birds in 25 years, that kind of data doesn't exist in a paper. And so, that's where you need to bring together knowledge holders who have on the ground experience, have um, that deeper understanding of the system in order to then elicit those, those predictions. And so what has been found in this field of decision science and expert elicitation, um, using real world um, examples of things that can be predicted, uh, such as political events or, um, various engineering results is that if you have a very diverse group of individuals, so different levels of experience, um, different ways of knowing, different genders, um, all of these things then make a more robust group estimate. 
And so it's important for the science, for the results to actually bring together a diverse group. But the goal is also that we have these results taken up by those decision holders, by those people with the purse strings. And so it's kind of a dual purpose thing where you have everyone who should be involved and in understanding what's going on in this estuary is part of the project. And by doing so, you also then get these more accurate results when you're looking at these predictions. And so you mentioned PMT, prior, priority, PTM, priority threat, threat management. Mm -hmm. um, is that a new tool? Is that a new scientific methodology? It's, I mean, what's new? <laughs> it's, uh, it's not new per se, it's new to the Fraser. Um, it's new to BC. So this is um, a conservation decision science framework that Tara Martin developed with um, a series of colleagues that she was working with for decades um, in Australia. And it's been applied numerous times in Australia and now actually across Canada. Um, but ultimately it's a framework that facilitates identifying the optimal management strategies that we can take to preserve the most species or uh, populations in an area for the least cost. Um, and so essentially Tara trained as an ecologist um, and then was frustrated that she was studying things that were disappearing before her eyes. So then she started to try to get into predictive ecology, um, looking at future impacts of threats on species and then still found that that wasn't enough um, to prevent species loss. And so she started to work um, with some other experts in Australia on trying to identify, you know, what is missing in species conservation and why are we failing at conserving species at risk? Um, and she found, you know, looking at systems across the globe in Australia and in Canada, that there are some common themes. And one is that it takes us way too long to go from paper to action. Um, there are numerous examples of species being studied to death. <laughs> and meanwhile, we've done nothing. Um, and another is that we often will focus on a single species, but we know that that's not how the world works. Um, ecosystems are complex, species interact with one another, and they're not independent from their environment. Um, and we often prioritize the wrong things. So we might prioritize conservation funds based on species status. So endangered species tend to get the most money thrown at them or their charisma. So large animals get more conservation funds than small plant species. Um, but when we're prioritizing those things, we're not actually focusing on the cost or the benefit or the feasibility of the actual management actions that we're trying to take to benefit those species. And so what uh, Tara has kind of found is that actually if it's the actions that cost money, not the species. And if we step back and we look at what are the available tools that we have, um, what are they going to cost? What's our current budget? Is there a gap there? And how many species can we benefit by each of these actions? Um, then you can have a much bigger kind of bang for your conservation buck. And so that's what inspired this approach. Okay. Um, Misty, um, just talking about who, who's at the table and, 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 and even looking at methods. Uh, this is a period of, of, of importance around reconciliation, decolonization, and and science and our research methods and our campaign work. Uh, you would know, of course, doing campaign work around salmon and research around salmon. What's the participation of First Nations uh, in the research project? Um, and, and who who's at the table? And I'm thinking perhaps the uh, Lower Fraser uh, Fisheries Alliance or were, were there uh, in, Indigenous uh, alliances and coalitions or was there particular nations that were involved? So, so I think that the invitation went to um, most nations within the Lower Fraser, and um, they are absolutely present. Um, and actually, Lee has done this twice now, and um, and I think that the first round, I uh, you know, I don't think anybody really wanted to go back in there, but there's, Lee had incredible participation for the for the for the next round from First Nations. It was more you know zoned in on salmon. But um, you know the value of having them in the process is is huge, and 
um, and it, it more and more uh, First Nations aren't just involved, but they're becoming the drivers of these initiatives, which is a, is a really great thing to see. Yeah, I mean, and especially if they, as they have more capacity and, and kind of pull out of this genocidal period that they've been subjected to, their, um, their, their internal resourcing of their own nations, their own land management, um, and also then being able to kind of use that muscle within the region and inform how we're doing land management and resource management across the region where they've, you know, historically by the crown have been kept out of. So can you talk a little bit more, just a little further about how that, or both of you around how that was, how their participation perhaps shifted some of the methods or brought a, a different, deeper understanding of Indigenous knowledge to, to, the, to the questions? Yeah. Well, I yeah, I was just going to say that you flagged that capacity is a is a huge issue, and so for um, for them to come to these uh, meetings that require they're lengthy, they're all days, they're several days. It's not um, a minor commitment, and so the the dedication that it takes to sit through these processes and participate is is just significant right there. Okay, you, you, Leah, your you take over. <laughs> Thanks, Misty. Yeah, that's. It's huge. And I, I think um, we are constantly learning. You know, Tara uh, is now a professor at UBC and she is just getting started with her work on this coast. Um, and so even just from, so with this project, you know, we tried to reach out to all of our networks um, and encourage participation from as many nations as we could. Um, and we got some participation and then, um, the follow-up project um, that's part of my PhD as well is applying the same approach, but focusing in on 19 salmon populations in the lower Fraser. So extending from the estuary up further towards kind of Lillooet as well. Um, and for that, you know, you, I, don't, <laughs> I don't think we could try to have any authority saying what's important for salmon in the lower Fraser without engaging with <laughs> the local nations that are there um, because they have such an innate understanding and they are the most concerned about what's happening with these populations out of any of us. Um, and so we did learn just between the two projects, you know, the extra amount of time we needed to take to build relationships and explain what we were trying to do and why we thought it would benefit uh, their communities as well. And also just hear from them um, you know, what they thought was important to include in terms of the management strategies we were looking at um, and how we're addressing the, the questions. And um, it's a, yeah, it's a tough format, as Misty said, sitting in a room <laughs> and trying to essentially wring the brains out of <laughs> all of the experts <laughs> in three days, um, ultimately. And what we did find is that, you know, um, that approach just doesn't work for everyone. And so there were a few participants where we went and did in-person follow-up um, after the initial workshop, just to make sure that they had an opportunity to be heard and to engage in the project. Um, and more, not all of them, but more of the individuals that we did that follow-up with were our First Nations participants. Um, so I think it just speaks to, you know, I think first we have to recognize the importance of, um, of acknowledging their immense knowledge and their right to these natural resources that we are trying to conserve. Um, and then we have to bend our Western science brains and think about how we can actually do this properly and do it better. The, the other thing that they bring that I found uh, is that even from a Western science perspective, they have the baseline they know what this was once like and and you get you know people that you know come come in you know at whatever stage in our careers it's all such a short short time frame and the and the problem of shifting baselines is so applicable and when first nations are in the room you can hear about the draining of sumas lake you can hear about these sloughs that were once connected the extent that salmon went um, you know, you know, across the, through the floodplains, you, you hear all that. And in it really, um, it's a stark reminder of how much has been lost in often in their lifetimes when they're elders that are there. And uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really, um, 
it really helps also with just, you know, in that, with that Western brain of, of framing what a baseline is. Yeah. And I mean, we're, 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 we're two and a half million people here. Um, some people, when they think about impacts on the phrase that they might point to that, that debate about whether the, the, uh, the tunnel should be built or a, a 10 lane bridge, um, uh, what is it called? The Dees tunnel, Dees Island tunnel, or, or, a, or a massive new bridge that the previous government wanted to build. And, and, People will ask, well, why is that needed? Is there more ships going up to Fraser? What's the, you know, how is the Fraser being used? How does the research and what we know, the average Vancouverite, Metro Vancouverite, what do we know about the Fraser? Um, you know, we drive over bridges or, you know, uh, you know, we know there's the Fraser, but but do we know that do we know it? And what did what did the research show in terms of these cumulative impacts? Um, that, you know that you're that you're showing like what's what is there a gap or is there is there some really concrete priorities that can address some of the things that the average citizen actually probably understands or witnesses when they when they look at the river and they see the massive industrialization and uh, urbanization so um yeah that that sort of getting into this this idea of cumulative effects and um, and, and that is a problem that is plaguing the whole the whole region and that these decisions for infrastructure or housing or a port expansion or a bridge rather than a tunnel um, are all made in, you know, and these in these siloed approaches that it's that they're one offs They're they look at that project and that project only and they don't consider the cumulative effect that all of these changes are having on the landscape and the ability of ecosystems to um, to function and and really what what species need is is functioning at ecosystems we've got to maintain the processes that that allow um, these species to thrive and 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 that's what we're eroding we're you know slowly um, fraying this this network um, and, and I think that the um, priority threat management does go there in terms of, uh, because that's, that's what these, this expert elicitation does is that, that they're bringing um, that awareness of these cumulative effects to the probabilities that species can persist under certain conditions. So, um, and, then, and then at the end, and Leah, you touched on this, is that, um, in, in, in looking at these probabilities, then one of the questions was, okay, now you've thought about all the things that have already happened in the estuary on, on your species of, um, of focus. And now, you know, I, we want you to consider um, that there's, a, um, there's an expanded um, shipping terminal at Roberts Bank. There's uh, a, an expanded um, oil terminal in Burrard Inlet. There's all these other projects that that are in the in the wings, and and what do they mean for the remaining habitat that has framed the probabilities that you've already used <laughs> about persistence over the next thirty years? What happens to those probabilities if these projects go ahead? And mm -hmm. and that starts to get at the problem of cumulative effects. Yeah, absolutely. So we did find that you know when we looked at continuing business as usual. So not including those major developments going ahead, but just continuing on this trajectory of some conservation, some restoration and some loss over time. Um, in 25 years, more than half of the 102 species were predicted not to be self-sustaining. And so that could mean that they're completely lost or it could mean that they're at very low levels. Um, and then we found, you know, when we looked at that future scenario of including all of these developments, that that just got much worse. <laughs> and so actually preventing that further decline, halting those future developments was one of the most beneficial strategies we could take for these species. Um, so, so, so yeah, I think so, it says a lot. <laughs> so, so, so using that framework, you were, because you, you told us a few minutes ago about, you know, low costs, big bang solutions are really important. So you're actually arguing that, or the research points to the fact that reducing cumulative impacts and stressors is actually a cost-effective way of achieving biodiversity goals? Yeah, essentially, yeah, that that is, and that's often the case. So, um, so that term cost-effective, um, 
is a bit of a, a jargon term that does mean specific things. So I will highlight, you know, if we looked at pure cost effectiveness, the, the cheapest strategy with a fairly high benefit was just dealing with um, problematic species, which includes invasive species removal. But when we do this assessment, we look also at um, the number of species that can be secured over, over time with each action. And so that's what I'm speaking to. So the benefit um, of preventing that future development was huge across all of those species groups. But yeah. <laughs> and, those are, and those are, can you explain a little bit? Because um, I'm mindful of how things are connected. So for example, if there's um, salmon coming from up the Fraser, they come to the, the ocean, they, they get attached by sea lice or sea lice brings them back up to the river uh, or a, a salmon is in the Fraser, but then there's a, a new Trans Mountain pipeline being built under the uh, Portman Bridge, that there's all these incidences that um, each have their own impact on the salmon's viability. So it's not just some pH balance in the water or the water temperature, but it's actually all these hurdles that the fish have to, or the, or the sandpipers have to jump through to survive to get to the next habitat or to the next. Um, yeah, so many, yeah, it's, it's a good point. And I'm glad you used salmon as an example because many of the species that use this estuary are migratory. And so they're passing through, which makes conservation of them difficult. But um, the reason we can still see benefits um, as well as impacts to these species when we're just looking at the estuary is that this is a massive system. So you were saying, you know, what do people think about when they look at the Fraser and they're passing over a bridge? I don't think most people realize how important the Fraser is and this estuary is. This is the largest delta on BC's coast. There's nothing like it <laughs> for our entire coastline. The closest next thing is the Skeena River, which is at the very northern extent of BC. Um, so this system is hugely important and, and has, uh, I think, greater than normal impacts on, on the total kind of fauna that are flora and fauna that are existing in our provincial coastal ecosystem. Um, but yeah, when you are a, a species and you're trying to survive, you have all your different life stage um, elements, you have different hurdles along the way. And so some of these things might have a direct impact on you. So if there is no spawning habitat or no rearing habitat for a fish, um, then you just die because there's nothing there. But some of them and more of them, I think, have these indirect effects. And that's where we start to see the effects of death by a thousand cuts. Because if, um, if your rearing habitat is reduced in your juvenile salmon, then you're competing with more fish for the same amount of space. You might have less food available um, than you would if there was the full extent of the delta available. You might also be physiologically impaired if the water quality is really bad. Um, certain contaminants can cause direct mortality, but many of them are thought to just increase your susceptibility to disease or maybe make you slower or less capable of avoiding predation. Um, so then you get out of the estuary and now you're just not as able to fend for yourself. Um, and similarly with adults returning, the more contaminants and the warmer the water, um, the higher your disease load. And depending on how far up the river you're traveling, the less likely you are to make it. So all of these things kind of chip away at your ability to thrive. Okay, and, and let's just uh, finish off our, our conversation about what you've learned in the report. What are, what are some of the kind of, um, I guess, high level um, priorities uh, before we jump into Robert's bank? What are, what are some of the important uh, highlights you wanna just leave off with um, to both of you? I think one of the key things is that this co-governance piece, you know, it's, it's been shown for a lot of different conservation work with um, parks and protected areas that you need to have community buy-in and, and good uh, relationships between conservation practitioners and users in order to have conservation success. But it hadn't really been quantified to our knowledge what the benefit would be of having 
some sort of cohesive governance structure over a complex system. So where you have multiple bodies of government working together with indigenous land and title holders um, and with you know, influence from conservation organizations and researchers. And we were able to find that all of these strategies had much greater feasibility of success if there was a, an effective co-governance structure in place. And that then brought up the benefit for all of those species. So I think that that's really important. Um, and, and when you talk about co-governance, are you talking about jurisdictions? So we specifically looked at it um, in terms of not trying to rework the entire system or the multiple systems that are already in place, but trying to identify some sort of um, legislative tool that could be used to, um, to bring all of these groups together within the context of managing the Fraser Estuary. And so we identify this as a Fraser uh, Estuary Act uh, that's kind of based off of similar acts uh, elsewhere in Canada, but essentially it's just a, another tool that helps to identify the key people at the table, um, provide legislative authority, and provide a clear mandate for action. And so in the Fraser, there was almost that kind of structure for a time called the Fraser River Estuary Management Plan. Um, and that was kind of a collaborative project between industry and government, um, didn't include First Nations. And that sort of benefited some things for a while, but then there were a number of flaws with it. Um, and it also lacked funding, so it ended altogether. So it was kind of stemming from conversations around this previous existence of this body, um, the experts identified kind of the need for this co-governance structure. And, and is that what we, uh, um, Michael Weeb, a city of Vancouver councillor, he was at uh, Metro Vancouver a couple of weeks ago, suggesting that Metro Vancouver announce a kind of new governance model for the Fraser River or? It's similar. It's, I don't think it's exactly that, but we were happy to, to hear that. Maybe Misty can speak more to it. Yeah, but it was, you know, it's the, it's the one other really exciting piece of this. Well, and I, 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 one is that it's not too late, Leah, you already mentioned that, but the other is that ideally tangible action can come from this paper. And um, so what Michael was proposing was that um, we get a, a body like the former Fraser Estuary Management um, Plan um, that can um, get, get together and, and start, you know, examining these co-governance things. Uh, issues, um, but we um, modified it, got Michael to modify his, his motion slightly so that it, it wasn't just a program, it's, you know, what Leah's describing is it's a co-governance model. And, uh, and so the, 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 the place marker is there and, and that's, that's all it takes to build what we really need. We need to, the, the, the other problem with FREMP was that it lacked, um, it lacked decision-making authority. So if we could take what was established initially, the idea that different levels of government, now including First Nations, could come together and make collective decisions that were based on the ecological um, objectives for the estuary, that, uh, that that's, where, that's where we need to go. Okay, and I, and I see there's a, in the chat here, uh, Anthony Stenner from Slaywatith is just uh, throwing a comment in there as well. So. Uh, talking about uh, to run dry or to stop flowing blood, the blood, water is the lifeblood of all life on earth. Um, Anthony in the comments there. Um, feel free to jump in Anthony if you wanna uh, share that. Um, so before we uh, go into Robert's Bank, uh, any final thoughts uh, on, on how, um, how essentially we're set up now with this report, with this body of research, with all the players at the table in, in, in engaged in that research development, uh, what, 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 what are, where are we at now with, with how do you feel as researchers and participants now that this is kind of publicly facing and, uh, and Aaliyah, you were just kind of rolling down before I started talking about governance, rolling down some of the kind of highlights for you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's incredibly inspiring to um, 
to conduct scientific research that actually has direct conservation application, you know, in an ecosystem that's highly important to me and to many others in this area. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd say to anyone who's interested in figuring out, you know, what you can do to benefit the Fraser Estuary and to help, we've essentially written a prospectus for some of the best <laughs> actions we can try to take. Um, and, you know, there is a scientific paper that is open access, freely available with a supplement as well, describing all of the actions that were identified by experts. Um, but there's also a much more digestible report um, on Tara Martin's website as well. And Rain Coast has links to it as well. Um, so if you are curious and want to know more about, you know, what actions we can take, then just reach out to us. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in terms of Robert's Bank, uh, obviously, uh, it's one of the, tonight is our, our, our first of three uh, uh, discussions and we've we've asked the minister for a meeting as well um, he happens to be our our constitu our, our MP for North Vancouver so um, we're hoping that, that we're able to meet with him but um, how, how does I, I mentioned at the outset this kind of and I, I say I say this with some hesitancy this kind of competing research I'm, I know I know when you look when you google some of these issues you'll see a lot of videos from the port of Vancouver they seem to be positioning them positioning themselves as the experts and and and, um, and 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 one can just imagine the millions of dollars that they've spent uh, on on that positionality um, around uh, presenting their own research as as the the uh, perhaps most pragmatic research or the best informed research. How does this research, uh, Misty, line up with other research? And 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 if we can start to kind of unpack a little bit about the political context to how this research is. Uh, emerging at a very kind of controversial moment for the Roberts Bank II project? Yeah, good, good question. And, and I mean, you, you touched on that a little bit at the very, in your introduction. And, you know, the, and I think that uncertainty is where, um, wh where um, in the case of support, maybe right now, um, claiming more certainty around things that there's a lot more uncertainty about. So, but, um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, oh yeah. Okay. So the, the, the way this process worked is the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency um, undertook a review of the project and they, um, they, they start with the submission from the port, which is their proposal to say, uh, this is what we want to do. And here's our conclusion about the impact that it's going to have. And um, and, you know, for the most part, the port's conclusions were th that the impact on whatever species that, you know, they were considering was negligible. But then as part of the process, um, the public and also um, the agencies of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, Environment Canada, and other, um, other uh, um, provincial agencies that have expertise on the certain topics that are being discussed also make submissions. And those submissions uh, didn't always um, align or conclude with the same um, level of confidence or even on the same, um, you know, on, on issues of significance about these, about the impacts. And so the panel, and it was chaired by David Levy, who is a salmon expert, um, has to go away after receiving submissions from, you know, organizations like Raincoast uh, to DF Fisheries and Oceans to Environment and Climate Change Canada and others and that have examined the project and raised their concerns and brought a level of expertise and scientific knowledge to the issue. Um, and, and the panel uh, goes away and um, goes through everything, and First Nations as well are there saying this is this is here's uh, this is our perspective. This is that can be over uh, rights and title. It can also be um, ecological. It can cover the whole range of concerns that First Nations would have as well. So the panel goes away, and uh, and they make conclusions. And in the case, in this case, they came back and they said the panel found that there would be significant adverse on effects on, um, on more of the species that the port had identified. And so that's where 
um, you know, you've got two bodies that one say significant adverse effects and the others say, say negligible. So, uh, the, um, and then that goes to Jonathan Wilkinson and that's where this process is right now. But, um, you know, we would argue and so would many others that there are significant adverse effects to specific species such as southern resident killer whales from the associated increase in shipping and noise through the Salish Sea to uh, Chinook salmon that are rearing in the estuary. So um, yeah, that's, so the, that's how the process goes. You mentioned um, indigenous communities and I know that we, we published uh, uh, in our Wingspan magazine uh, some some perspectives from Slo uh, from Suwas and uh, uh, the people facing the sea, um, and of course they are directly impacted, directly in front of Roberts Bank too. And they talked about some of their concerns being the development of new infrastructure, alienating community members from their own lands and waters, contamination, dust, noise, increased traffic, um, uh, ability to harvest fish and migratory birds, uh, the decline uh, in the spiritual relationship with killer whales. Uh, and the community members, uh, cr disruption of critical habitat and cumulative effects, and um, the opportunity for slow, uh, for Swaston children to learn about their own culture due to environmental degradation. So that's were some of the observations from Swaston. Um, has there been other, in, in your observation, um, um, Indigenous communities, Indigenous nations, uh, whose, whose unceded lands that the project impacts, have, has there been comment from other Nations, Misty, are you aware of other? Uh, well, they, um, um, from a shipping perspective, they uh, um, the port went to many of the nations that would be along the route of uh, of the shipping corridor. So that extends from the west side of Vancouver Island all the way to Cowichan, um, and they consulted with some of the nations within the Lower Fraser, but they. Um, you know, I would argue that um, that there the impact on say just Fraser Chinook and uh, say South Thompson Fraser Chinook that that those fish are hugely valuable to uh, the First Nations um, in um, in the North Thompson and they were not um, they were not invited to participate in this process. So just as one example. I think that there are other First Nations that could be um, affected by this project that uh, depending on, you know, where you think the extent of those impacts lies, like is it is it just a footprint and a few ships or is it a footprint that affects um, many populations from the Fraser coming from all over the Fraser and, and, and it may affect other um, nations that rely on uh, salmon coming back to the Fraser. So uh, yeah, you know, where you draw the line might be arbitrary. Yeah, and I think I think for some for some people who are trying to understand this issue, uh, we see this kind of growth of the port and and that the port uh, is spending, uh, I don't know if it's their own money or if it's money from um, future revenues, but um, they have their own uh, business modeling that that is never really made public. But um, the, um, the the port is essentially saying everything's under control. Yes, there's uh, uh, there's potentially some impacts, but it's um, negligible. The the um, you you mentioned some of the impacts, um, and you you mentioned that that we don't necessarily know the breadth and the scope and the extent. Um, but if, if you could just describe for a moment, Misty, the, the kind of physical infrastructure of what we're talking about. Um, people know they go to Sawas and they take the ferry, perhaps. They know there's a lot of trains there. There's coal trains. Uh, there's some export facility there. What are we talking about in terms of the scale or the change? And, and why does it matter with the Roberts Bank, too? Right. So the, um, the Fraser Delta is is huge. So it, it stretches exactly like you said from you know south of the Ferry Causeway right down to you know south of um, you know to Roberts Point Roberts all the way up to UBC is the actual delta like the the tidal delta of the Fraser and then the estuary itself you know is is larger than that where there's this mixing of of fresh and and salt water. 
And uh, so what's happened to the delta of the estuary over, um, over the decades is that it's sort of been dissected and bisected by these structures, everything from the Tawasan Ferry Terminal to then Delta Port to jetties that um, extend from um, Steveston to uh, the Iona Wastewater Treatment Jetty to the North Arm Jetty and, and all of these physical structures uh, they, they sever and alter the way that fresh and salt water mix and the conditions that it creates for salmon that want to rear in that estuary habitat. And so um, already that long finger, four kilometer long causeway going out to Delta Port is already a significant presence that, now this study has never been conducted, even though it was identified in the 1980s that the port needed to better understand how juvenile salmon were migrating around um, or the, the success of their migration around that, um, that causeway, those studies were never done. But the, uh, it's assumed by salmon scientists that that causeway is a barrier to their movement because they want to stay as tiny little fry. They want to stay close to the shore in the shallow water where there's a suitable habitat for them and the food that they need at that life stage. And when they're forced to swim quite a ways out to Georgia Strait almost um, into salty and deep water, that that's um, that's a journey that, that may not have a high success rate for a tiny little fish. And, and so now with this extension, they want to go further, literally all the way now to Georgia Strait, like right off the, right off the bank, off the flats of the Delta, out into Georgia Strait and double the size of the physical footprint that would go down on eelgrass and mud flats and the, and the um, conditions in the estuary that, um, that, um, that fish and other species rely on. So, um, so that's, that, that, that is um, a concern for, you know, if we're just looking at um, one type of, um, one species of salmon in the Fraser as juveniles, those Chinook that are ocean type, they come down to the estuary and Lee is actually just publishing a paper to, <laughs> right now um, that we did when we were uh, looking at their, um, how long they want to spend in the estuary rearing. And so, so some of these types of, of Chinook from the Fraser, they come down to the estuary and they will spend, um, you know, a month to two months rearing and getting ready for the next phase of their big ocean journey. And um, and growing and feeding in preparation for that. So the estuary is hugely important to these fish and it has already been compromised through so many ways that this expansion is, is just another, uh, yeah, a death, by, death by a thousand cuts as Leah said earlier. So, um, so that's, um, that the problem is that the actual issue has never been studied. Nobody has conducted a study to say, what is the success rate of juvenile salmon migrating, uh, in tra travel, traversing around this footprint, getting into the eelgrass on the other side? And, um, and what is the extent of the problem? So it's really, it's, 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 it's it's not quite speculation, but it's expert opinion on what on on understanding how juvenile salmon use the estuary, how do they move, uh, what their requirements are, and what might happen when you implement these kinds of changes. And we do Structure. have probably the closest thing we have to trying to answer that question um, is comparing some of the studies that were done when this FREMP body was existing. So in the in the 80s, basically, there were a number of SANE studies done looking at salmon movements in the estuary. Um, and, and then we've been SANING in the estuary since 2016. And the number of fish that we catch now already on that um, south side of the Delta Port Terminal, even in its current existence, are much lower in general than the numbers that they were catching in the 80s. And that was actually before the first expansion of the cohort. So it's not scientifically robust to say that that's direct evidence, but if you are somebody who thinks about how these juvenile salmon move, um, it, it seems to support that if we were going to take a precautionary approach, we'd have to assume there could be negative impact. And, and the, uh, we're talking about 
um, the way you know we, we you're talking a, a, like a long lens of of how things were managed in the past. Uh, there's some gaps in research. Um, if we can be a little political here for a minute, what's the um, what's the play that the port the port of Vancouver, the Greater Vancouver port, Fraser Vancouver Fraser Port Authority is doing right now? Because they they've they they spend public dollars or or industry dollars on their own research, and then they have a very very huge communications department which essentially spins it, produces websites, produces reports, produces videos. They try to kind of control the message uh, as if they're kind of like, you know, one arm is assessing the other arm and, and everything's good to go and, until the federal government perhaps um, uh, see uh, slows them down. But what, what's, what's at play here? Like if there's, a, if there's, a, if there's death by a thousand cuts, um, what, what is the role of, of research, engaged research especially in this moment, this very highly political moment. Um, what's next step for research and how, can, and how can the viewers of this video understand what should they be reading and how should they be critically understanding these competing narratives of everything's fine, it's good to go versus actually we don't have a fulsome assessment of the, of the cumulative impacts, let alone the, the direct impacts on shutting, shutting off this, uh, these mudflats. So before we get into where the research was gonna, is going to go, I want to respond to what you've said. Is that the port is you know saying yes, that, you know we can we can mitigate this, but clearly Environment Canada and Wilkinson's office have said have accepted a report that says there are significant adverse effects, and and what the minister has done is um, put a very uh, detailed request back in front of the port to say here is a long list of concerns and things that we still need to know, but um, we, what, what we really need to know is how you're going to mitigate these effects. For this project to go ahead, given that it has these significant adverse effects, how are you going to mitigate them? And that's where things get very tricky and um, where the port may be running out of options because there's not a lot of options to mitigate the effects of this footprint in the space and time that is appropriate to the survival of juvenile salmon. You can't um, do a habitat offsetting program somewhere else in the river um, to compensate for the decline in habitat that juvenile salmon need at that certain stage in their, um, at, in their life cycle. And, um, and, and that's where uh, I think, you know, and then now the port is wanting to say, well, okay, so maybe if we can't can, um, offset these, the, or mitigate the, the, um, these impacts, can we consider unconventional um, offsetting? And, and that's the discussion that is unfolding now. And, um, and, I, and I would bring it right back to, well, if, they, if, these, if this effect, these effects cannot be mitigated, then this project should not should not go ahead, and we don't have enough um, estuary habitat remaining uh, to um, support. Like it doesn't matter how much we restore habitat further up the Fraser, when they get to the estuary, they need habitat in the estuary. So um, if if these effects cannot be successfully mitigated, this project should not go ahead. And and I and so I, that's where we you know where I would come down firm on what we know now and what we know about the ability to mitigate these effects. And and those two things right now do not align. Um, now the the if the port was in the room, the port would say um, you know that this is. Uh, it's sort of like um, market determinism that 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 jobs, that shipping containers. This is twenty five percent growth in the need for shipping containers through the region here. Uh, where does that narrative come from, and 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 should we treat it with respect? Uh, I mean, I'm not saying jobs are not important, but I get confused sometimes. And help me out here. There's these narratives that it seems inevitable that this shipping container. That we have more shipping need for shipping containers is that the like we have more WalMarts opening up in the in the prairies so that we need more shipping containers coming through the port of the Greater Vancouver Greater Vancouver Port. Like, what's the logic? Am I missing something, or is it that is it just that 
straightforward that there's this narrative that we're all supposed to accept that there's disposable climate areas or disposable climate consequences of ships. And I don't believe they're all gonna be using LNG. You know, ships coming across the, of the ocean, coming to Roberts Bank too, and, and it's okay if we dispose of a few species because this is for a greater economic need. Is that, is that, is that the narrative that we're supposed to be agreeing to? Well, I, I think that, you know, that just raises the, the it, it's all about these bigger, these bigger issues that come back to our consumption choices and our footprint on the planet. And that, um, though, and, and making those kinds of decisions in favor of um, furthering that, um, that economic model have, has been what's landed us in this predicament where we have more than a hundred species at risk in the in the Fraser estuary. So, at what point do we re-envision the way that um, that we live on the planet? And it, it and it does. It gets into all those issues about um, you know getting. Well, I can be dismissive in how I describe those goods from <laughs> coming from Asia, but um, yeah, you know, is there is there a different way, and uh, is there a way where we would? Um, champion more regional sustainability um, rather than uh, rather than the model that we've relied on, and I and I think it does it does get into that. But um, the, I think that the cost of continuing to make decisions as we have made them is is really evident, and um, and the challenge with with doing the priority threat management is that you know there's there's a plan. But um, we, we need to act now. Like I was thinking today that even since we started this process in the Fraser Estuary, I know there are more species and populations on that list now than when we started it. And, uh, and so if we don't really collectively say, you know, we, we can't continue down this road. We've, and, and I think that, I, you know, if there's one, silver lining in, in COVID, it's, it's thinking about how, how we're intertwined in our global economy and that, um, and that we are dependent on outsourcing and goods from other places and when they don't arrive, it's a, it's a crisis. So I think that maybe more than ever, not from an ecological perspective, but even just from an economic one, there may be reasons why we would want to rethink that model. But you're absolutely right. It gets into those all those bigger issues. Um, and in terms of the the right. research side of it, um, you know, I'm I'm trying to become a conservation ecologist, but I think there's more and more um, need for what Tara calls forensic accounting, <laughs> and um, kind of an emerging field um, is looking at not only the true costs of going ahead with our, our typical model of just grow and expand and build and, um, and make money, but looking at the, like the true costs of that on us, on our species, on our future revenues, um, but then also looking at the true revenues of preserving that natural environment. So we're really starting to see, you know, we're in a, the sixth global mass extinction event of all history <laughs> and it's, it's overwhelmingly human caused. And we're starting to see that, you know, we are globally reaching the edges of this planet. Um, no, I'm not a square earth, flat earther, but like we're <laughs> reaching the, the limits of what our planet can sustain. And as that breaks down, we suffer, we're the ones who suffer, it costs us. Um, and so the Fraser Estuary is just one system in this global system of, of things that are starting to fall apart, um, but it's a very important one and it's in our backyard. And so we have to really think about what our values are and what we need to sustain ourselves, um, you know, in generations to come. So it's, yeah, I think, I think that the, uh, it's important to note the systems that we're working within and the port is a huge player in this system and they're um, both, you know, a, a massive economic driver and they also do um, basically pay for all of the habitat remediation in this system. And um, 
they are just playing the game as they know it. Um, but they are, they are an industry. And so their goals are not the same as, you know, mine and Misty's personal research conservation goals. So we have to recognize, you know, this is part of the need for that co-governance framework that we need, we need to have a, a common goal for what we want this system to look like in 20, 50, 100 years, and then we can act within that. And I think, I think what this is also bringing up is, is the fact that when, when the Port Authority was created uh, and, and it, it sort of monopoly on, on authority and jurisdiction, uh, it, it, it set us up for these complicated questions. For example, why is the Pacific Northwest why is it turning into a carbon export zone? And you know, was there ever a referendum on that? Were the First Nations ever asked? Were the was were the Metro Vancouver residents ever asked? Were was the Lummi or Bellingham population ever asked that this is going to be turned into a massive carbon export zone? Not just Roberts Bank, Westridge, and Trans Mountain Pipeline, and all these uh, coal export. So th because it's siloed in in each industrial expansion project is siloed and, and the assessments are siloed and the public review processes are siloed. Here we are essentially uh, by design playing catch up. Um, but I think the two of you have, your, your research has really helped set up, set us up for a better understanding of the issues. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm grateful that uh, you're able to share it tonight. Uh, maybe we can open it up. Uh, there's a few people here in the room that uh, may, may have a question or a comment for Misty or Leah. I have one question in the chat. Can I just say what a wonderful discussion. I think I can speak for everyone here. I've just been so engaged in learning so much. So thank you. Um, we have one question from Jacqueline earlier. Um, she is curious if the port is on board with the research or um, and how much participation or not they had in the PTM um, model that you guys developed and if they're supportive of the co-governance model. So I think those are multiple questions. Thanks, thanks, Jack, for the question. Um, yeah, so they did participate. Um, we had multiple members from the Port Authority participate um, and they contributed a lot to the project. Um, but again, being on board is, is not the same as participating. <laughs> and I think there are multiple branches of the Port Authority and most of the participation came from there their research scientists and their habitat specialists um, who are, are great people, um, but those are not the same people making decisions about RBT2. Um, but Misty, I know, has talked a lot more closely with some people at the port, I think. <laughs> um, and we're, we've absolutely shared the results with them and, and we hope that they appreciate the guidance, but yeah. And, and, um, and I think the port, you know, they're, it, they're trying to do the right thing, given that they are who they are. And e even the port in when, you know, in, in looking at the need for uh, Terminal 2 expansion had a scenario where they um, considered, well, what if, um, what if regionalism and this focus on regional economies was to unfold, then we wouldn't need to go ahead with Terminal 2. So I think that they have identified that there are other options. They just need the public and our decision makers to say, hey, now it's time. We want to pursue these other options. And I, and I think that if that, um, if we can get to that stage, then then they're on board. But right now they're very caught in the, um, you know, in the, in the economic model that we've all bought into and, uh, and they're doing what they look at projections and from their perspective, this is, this is needed. Now, it's, uh, it's interesting that global containers, I don't know if you've seen any of their videos, <laughs> We can take some lessons from their videos, and, but they're very good and they're very critical. This is Global Containers that operates Delta Port right now, very critical of Port ex of Terminal 2. And they say it's not necessary. It's going to cost taxpayers a fortune and that the shipping projections um, suggest that it's not, ne it's not needed. So, um, so if anyone wants to sort of see what another industry perspective is that operates ships at Delta Port right now, Google Global Containers and look at their videos. They're very good. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I think that 
yeah, it's, you know, how do we, we're going down a road and how do we, how do we turn around that, um, that we've got to get to the, the port does, we do work with the port on, um, on the work that we're doing in the estuary and, you know, they're very supportive of, of our restoration efforts to improve habitat quality in the estuary. Yeah. And I think it's also important to know, you know, it's, we're, we're not trying to, well, I, at least I don't think Missy and I are trying to, uh, villainize the port in any way. They are who they are, as you said, and they have these goals and these mandates that aren't first and foremost preserving the estuary, but they do, as a port, they actually do go above and beyond on a number of environmental initiatives. Um, they've done a lot of voluntary research. Um, they've done an experimental slowdown to try to minimize noise impacts. You know, I think they're aware that they have a big environmental impact and a big environmental footprint. And if they could, if they could maximize their revenue and, and not have any impact at all, I think they would choose to do that. But I think it's a very complicated world that we live in, so. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, guess that's, I guess maybe that we could borrow some lessons from the Trumpites because, um, you know, do, do the, do, does the public, um, if there was a referendum, around salmon and, and orca versus competing with Long Beach, California to have the largest container shipping terminal or we're competing with Rotterdam. I don't think, I think it'd be hands down. People would be voting for salmon and, and voting for sandpipers. So I think that that question is a certainly kind of what I'm, what I'm looking at. Um, and, and I think we'll have more conversations about this in our series. Uh, I'm just thinking about some other guests that we can bring on who are ports and logistics experts to maybe ask that question as well. Like, is this actually needed? And, and who's driving this? Uh, and can can there be a coalition of not just bird lovers and salmon lovers and and ecologists like yourselves, but you know, reaching more and more of the public? Um, Marissa, you're going to point out, um, and I guess we'll put it in the in the in the comment section of this video on Facebook and YouTube uh, about how people can get involved and and do letter writing. But Mar um, Misty, also um, your thoughts on the campaign? Uh, Raincoast Conservation's uh, put some great resources into it. Can you just describe from Raincoast's perspective the campaign and what the public can do? Yeah, so ultimately, um, the bottom line is that this port expansion can't go ahead if we're going to keep um, iconic species like southern resident killer whales that cannot, um, you know, where, where the environment that they're living in is already too noisy, and, um, and Chinook salmon, where the environment that they're living in is already very limited. So if we want to keep these species um, and, and their possibility of recovery, that this project simply needs to be re rejected. So uh, we're asking people, they can go to our website, yeah, they can send um, they can send a letter to uh, Environment and Environment Canada and Climate Change Minister Jonathan Wilkinson, who is here on the West Coast in Vancouver, and um, tell him to reject this and then CC your letter to your own MP. Because the way that we're going to create that groundswell of, for rejection is when uh, the public tells the representatives that this is a bad idea, that we don't want it to go ahead, and they um, they also say, you know, within within cabinet that this is a bad idea, and the people in the West Coast do not want this project. So, and we're look, we're yeah. So that's the um, if people can send a letter to Jonathan Wilkinson and CC their local MP, that would be great. Okay. Already sent it to uh, Jonathan Wilkinson. He's also my MP in North End. So. Oh, I've, I put in the chat a couple links. I put it in the Raincoast letter template that um, you were just speaking about. And I've also put in a petition from Nature Canada as well. Is right. the Nature Canada petition still live? It looks to be. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Marissa, do you want to just give a shout out to the next events that we're doing? Yeah. So I'll put this in the chat in a second, but uh, our next event in the series of observing this issue about rejecting the Roberts Bank Terminal too, is um, we'll be talking to a few people from Birds Canada, James Casey and Graham Sorensen, um, about birds at risk in the Fraser River estuary. And we'll have, we'll expand on this conversation. We'll be focusing a little bit more on birds and we hope you can join us. And I'll just be putting that in the chat right now for you to, to join. And if you, if you want to, you can go onto our Facebook page and we'll have the registration links there as well. Um, 
And here's some other events that we'll be having in January. At the end of, the, of January, we'll also be hosting the third event in our uh, Reject Roberts Bank Terminal 2 campaign. Um, and that will be centered around estuary governance. So yeah. Okay. Uh, est estuary governance specifically in terms of natural resources? Yes. In terms of the models, I guess that's Michael Weeb's, uh, that so people are interested in governance and, and land management, that'll be a good one for them. Um, and also it'll be interesting, um, I'm thinking it'd be interesting to get um, position the issue of logistics in international ports with uh, estuary governance and, and, and have that kind of a head to head, um, looking at different models of how we use land and why and all right, Misty and uh, Leah, uh, final comments oh, uh, to you. The floor is yours. It was a pleasure to have this conversation and I, and I hope that um, it spurs more dialogue on, on these issues. Um, it, was, it was really great to, to be a part of this, so thank you. Cool, thanks for all your work, Misty. Yeah, thank you so much for, for having me. And, um, and yeah, I hope I represented our research team well. I'm just one member of many, but yeah, I encourage anyone who's in the Lower Mainland area to safely try to get outside, go to Rifle Bird Sanctuary, check out the estuary, and uh, think about how we can work together to, to help it. That, that yeah. photo that you were showing and that, um, you know, with Lee and I on it, that was both, there were, both those photos were taken in the Fraser Estuary. <laughs> uh, I just want to say thank you to the audience as well for all of your insightful comments and your questions and your interests as well. Yeah, and Leah, you're talking about uh, you have a goal to be a, a restoration ecologist, but uh, clearly you're firmly already doing that work. So congratulations and thanks for all your <laughs> yes. work with us tonight as well. Thank you. Super. Thanks so much. Th thanks for tuning in, everybody. All right. Take thanks. Care. Bye. Thank okay. you. And I'll stop the video. Okay, the video stopped. Are you able to stop the live from your end? Or do we have to get Nicole on here? <laughs>